on Mars is going to start with farming, and any farming on Mars is going to start with a few key ingredients. Seeds, soil, sunlight, water, and one other critical thing, insects. Today we're going to take a look at all of the ways that insects are going to be crucial to food and farming on Mars. I'm Sarah Gilbert, and this is the Martian Street Food Society. My name is Aziwe Matuane. Um, I am a paleobotanist. I'm doing my PhD at Rhodes University and I'm a research associate at the Albany Museum. My name is Christy Reddick and I am the director of the Bug Chicks. Um, I am an entomologist and I focus on camel spiders, which are uh, also called Solifuge arachnids. And they are my favorite animals on the planet, on this planet and in the galaxy. My name is Jessica Honecker and I am the assistant director at the Bug Chicks. And uh, my focus is on um, integrated pest management, specifically um, aphids and the effects of their honeydew on agroecosystems. And, um, and if there were going to be any animals that caused you problems trying to grow food on Mars, it's going to be my bugs. <laughs> Insects have been a crucial part of plant life here on Earth for hundreds of thousands of years. Without them, many plants, including food crops, would struggle to grow, flower, fruit, or reproduce. In fact, we can actually see this plant-insect interaction in the fossil record. With the evolution of insects and plants, you know, uh, this mutualism goes back millions of years ago. If you look at uh, the earlier years, by earlier, I mean about a hundred million years ago. <laughs> so there was evidence of, um, of plant-insect interactions like millions of years ago. It goes, dates back before um, you had your flowering plants. So for example, in the, I work in the Permian and that is about 299 to 252 million years ago. We do find evidence of insect plant interactions. So how do insects actually help plants, including the crops that we would need to eat? Let's start with the most obvious, pollination. There are different types of pollination, right? So uh, there's a self-pollination and cross-pollination. In terms of a cross-pollination, it is uh, insects that actually, um, for example, will, will, get, um, will get pollen from the stigma, sorry, from the anther, uh, which is the male part of a plant, and uh, transfer it to the stigma, which is the female part of the plant, but of a different plant. Obviously, we think about insects and we think pollination, right? We think, and when we think pollination, in most cultures, we think bees. But there are, there's so much more to pollination besides the European honeybee, which when people think bees, they normally think European honeybee. Um, and then we totally sort of don't think about flies as pollinators. They're incredible pollinators. And then beetles are the most numerous. Oh, Jess, were you just- Oh, I, no, I was just gonna say beetles too. <laughs> People don't think about beetles as being pollinators. There are so many different species and so many, so many of those species that just by sheer numbers, they're you know, fairly effective at pollinating. Yeah. And then of course, moths and butterflies. But with moths and butterflies, you get into a sort of a catch-22 because as larvae, they are crop pests, but as adults, they are great pollinators. And some moths are some of the only night flying or dusk pollinators for flowers and other plants that kind of only release their pollen at night. In addition to everything they do up at the top of the plant, like pollination, these animals are also critical for the things that happen at the bottom of the plant, the root system. Animals like insects and worms help break up the rock and the soil, which allows the plant's roots to grow. If the soil isn't soft enough, the roots can't grow outward. They're also responsible for aerating the soil, which is what allows the nutrients and the water to pass through the soil to the plant's roots. Now, given how rocky Martian soil, or regolith, is, this step is incredibly important to the health of the plants and crops on Mars. So in terms of aeration, you have your, um, your, your ants that actually uh, create tunnels that allow for water to sip in and actually the water to be accessed by plants. But also you have like small bugs that actually live underground 
and those are in like our ecosystem engineers. So they break down the dead plants and uh, create organic matter that is further broken down by microorganisms that actually live in the soil. So uh, insect, insects play a vital role in the production of our topsoil and also providing the nutrients that our plants need to, um, to make the food that we need and to also grow, obviously. <laughs> They aerate the soil. They're, they're really creating tunneling systems that, that bring oxygen into the soil and also bringing nutrients up from very, very deep in the soil. And they're really tilling the soil. They're bringing up soil that has a lot of nutrients from deep underground and bringing it up to the surface where tree roots can utilize it, trees and plants. Yeah, and they're also helping to sort of loosen up that soil too, Chris, you had mentioned um, bringing in the oxygen, but it also prevents the soil from becoming so compacted that roots can't go out to reach, you know, as far as they could if the soil were loose and reach some of those nutrients that might be outside of the boundaries. Now, it's easy to focus on how these creatures help plants live, but they are also pretty crucial in helping them die. These animals help break down dead and decaying matter, which returns nutrients to the soil. It's a crucial step in the life cycle that Martian farmers can't overlook. Yeah, de decomposition is a, is a big one. We would be up to our eyeballs in poo were it not for animals that break down waste of other animals and then, of course, organic, rotting organic matter of fruits and vegetables and trees and bark and leaves and all the things. Really, we can't think about insects and, and, and what they produce food-wise or, or pollination-wise without thinking about how there are other insects that come in and break things down in order to create healthy soils, in order to grow more plants. It truly is a cycle, and they're a huge part of that. Since these insects have evolved on Earth, that means their abilities, like flight or navigation, have also evolved based on Earth norms, like Earth's gravity or our magnetic field. So how does that change when we get to Mars or even in places like the International Space Station? With a lot of the, anim a lot of the insects that they've brought up um, into space to date, like bees can learn how to function in gravity, but other animals that might be used as pollinators like some flies can't fly they can't figure it out mm. they are um sort yeah. of um relegated to crawling on on the walls of their little tanks i mean bees are going to be your most yeah. efficient pollinators however they're really struggling right now in all of the studies where they're where they're trying to use bees to try to get bees to live in these sort of simulated Mars environments. They're really struggling with it. Part of it's temperature, mm -hmm. part of it's sunlight, like daylight and sunlight and sort of uh, optimizing that for the bees. Part of it is um, giving them enough diversity and variety in their diet so that they are healthy. Um, some insects are phototactic, meaning they are very attracted to the light. Some insects use light as a guidance and navigation system. That's why you'll often see insects that get a little confused with reflective pavement glittering at night off of street lights. They'll think it's a lake or a pond and land there and then bake to death on hot asphalt in the summer because they think they're landing in water that glitters like that to them. So um, there are going to be important things like that, light and, and maybe magnetization. If you're, if you're using specific insects that do have those magnets, trying to figure out how to manage that is going to be hmm. a real challenge. It's also important to remember that while these insects are helping give us food, that relationship goes both ways. And some of our current farming techniques are not particularly helpful for them. Currently, in the West, we rely pretty heavily on a farming technique called monocropping. Now, this is where farmers take entire fields and plant them with just one crop, like an entire field of corn. It's an incredibly efficient way to farm if you're looking at harvesting, but it's not necessarily the best for the plants themselves or for the insects that need a variety of different pollens in their diet. Monocropping is terrible. <laughs> Monocultures can be really damaging to bees. Yeah, and you know, I, I hope that, you know, once 
once we actually do get colonies on Mars that we learn from that particular mistake that we make down here. It's like monocropping is really great, I guess, for like getting huge amounts of the same thing to ship out, but it is so bad for the environment and it's so bad for the pollinators because it's like, can you imagine eating only potatoes every day for the rest of your life? You would be deficient in so many other vitamins and, and minerals. Yeah. You know, I would hope that I would hope that there would be enough plants and diversity of food sources to keep whatever insects they choose as pollinators super healthy. For hundreds of thousands of years, humans have crossbred some animals in order to select for certain traits, like breeding some dogs to be herding dogs and others to be hunters. So if we wanted to create the perfect insect to help us out on Mars, what insects would we need to start crossbreeding right now to make that happen? And what traits should we be selecting for? I love this question. I'd breed for space constraints. You know, like dragonfly wings. Like that's an animal that needs to be like out in the meadow, you know? They're not gonna do well in a small environment. So thinking about space constraints, I'd, I'd breed for that. Jess, what would you breed for? Environmental resilience. So I think about like cockroaches and how, does it get really cold? Doesn't matter. Does it get really hot? Doesn't matter. Just a, a remarkably resilient and adaptive animal. Oh, our selection. We, we need, yeah. we need them to lay a lot of eggs. Mm -hmm. We need them to lay a lot of eggs. Oh, I would also select for parthogenesis. They need to be able to clone themselves like walking sticks. The beautiful thing about parthenogenesis is that the females don't need males to reproduce, right? They just clone themselves. And some species can lay hundreds and hundreds of eggs in one go. Some scientists argue that rather than bring insects with us all the way to Mars, we should be able to simply design and build drones to do their tasks instead. And this might be a viable option. However, so far the tests for pollinating with drones haven't been particularly successful. Drones actually uh, do not um, successfully pollinate as much as insects and other um, and other animals do. From the study that was done, I think in Japan, where they were trying to see if the drones would, could actually successfully pollinate, it was 54% 50, um, pollination success out of uh, like, out of 100. They had a problem firstly with collecting the pollen. So the pollen would stick properly on the hairs of the drones that they actually um, designed. And then the other was a successful landing on the stigma. So, uh, so unlike bees, which would be like very easy, uh, it would take a number of attempts to actually uh, be successful in landing on the stigma. Now, not every plant needs to be pollinated. Many of them don't, including some crops, but the ones that don't, don't produce seeds. Now, some of these can regenerate themselves, but others can't. In some cases, this might mean that a Mars colony would be reliant, at least for a little while, on frequent shipments of seeds from Earth. That would mean transferring, so transporting a lot of seeds from Earth. You can't produce seeds without pollination. So if you are, except if you are going to um, hand pollinate, for example, because they are they're, they're, they're aware where there's human intervention, and humans actually go plant by plant and pollinate uh, the different plants. Or what could happen is, is to bring in new seeds uh, from Earth, right? And then uh, without the use of pollination, you can actually use the plants to grow themselves like back again. Like for example, carrots will grow back, leafy vegetables will grow back, uh, potatoes will grow back without the need for pollination. So, um, so things like that, looking at different uh, plants that are useful and crops that are useful um, and do not necessarily need the extra pollination uh, that is required. So what are our takeaways? One, in order to help our pollinators navigate, Mars might need magnets or special lights in its greenhouse. Two, we need insects that will pollinate aerate the soil, and help decaying matter decompose. These might not all come from the same insect, so we might have to take a variety. And three, 
In order to guarantee the health of our pollinators, the greenhouses on Mars can't be structured based on monocropping. We'll need a variety of plants in the same basic area. If you have a favorite insect or one that you think would be perfect for a trip to Mars, let me know in the comments section. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Hey, Bee, we were just talking about you.